Warren, in trying to understand whether we as human beings have some non-physical component to soul, the advances in neuroscience are really critical. And you've used it to show why a soul, if not entirely non-existent, is extremely unlikely. Mm -hmm. How can you use neuroscience so powerfully to overturn millennia of, uh, of, of human belief? One way to look at the relationship between neuroscience and body-soul dualism is to look at the things that the soul has been used to account for. Okay. So with Descartes, Descartes couldn't figure out how a physical being could be rational. A physical thing could be rational. Therefore, it had to be a non-physical thing. It had to be a soul. Well, there's a lot of neuroscience that talks about rational properties in different parts of the brain. So our ability to use language, to do calculations, to uh, think spatially, to uh, have a rational social understandings, a theory of mind. All of these things are rational properties that we know a whole lot about the way the brain operates to do those things. So Descartes probably wouldn't have made that move had he known the rational neuroscience or the neuroscience of rationality. Uh, another thing that has been talked about uh, uh, as a property of the soul is relationality, the ability of persons to be deeply relational to one another or even our relationship with God. But we now have a, a whole what's called social neuroscience, which is a, neur a neuroscience of human relationship or human interrelationship of empathy and um, uh, uh, trust and all of the sort of relational things we know a whole lot about the neuroscience that goes behind relationality. So you can show in the brain what's be active during times of trust or, or no, empathy. Or, yeah, or distrust, or or we know even hormones that, that get involved to increase trust, like oxytocin. Right. And so we are now have a kind of a rich a neuroscience of human relationality. And we even have disorders of relationality, like autism is a fairly, mm. fairly uh, significant one, and we don't know yet the brain's processes involved in autism, but we've got some pretty good theories. So relationality seems to be something pretty tied in with brain function. Another one was morality, that, that in order to be a moral individual, one had to have a soul. Uh, but there's a whole lot of moral neuroscience or neuroscience of morality that has been done in the last probably 10 years, looking at people making uh, solving moral dilemmas and looking at the brain systems involved in solving moral dilemmas. Uh, I don't actually think the moral life has anything to do with abstractly solving moral dilemmas, but it's an interesting question nevertless, mm -hmm. and there are other ways of doing well, that. Well, the point being that neuroscience yeah. can address yeah, issues can address in the morality. Question. Yeah, and in fact, these have fed back into the theories of what moral processing is by uh, kind of differentiation, be, differentiating between sort of propositional and, and, and emotional influences on moral decision-making. And so you can actually parse those questions a little bit using neuroscience. So now it's clear that morality is understandable in at least the way we engage morality, not necessarily what sort of the ultimate moral standards are, but how does a human being engage the moral world? Mm -hmm. And we know that that, that, that is, the brain is deeply implicated in moral neuroscience. And the last one was religiousness. And of course, we thought always thought that our religiousness was fundamentally a manifestation of soul. what my soul did. So mm -hmm. the way I experience my soul is primarily in my religious experiences. Mm -hmm. But now we have a big neuroscience on religious experience, and this religious experience has this pattern of brain activity, and that kind of religious experience has that kind of brain activity. If you're Speaking in tongues, glossolalia, your brain's doing this. And if you're meditating like a Buddhist does, your brain is doing that. And so we have a whole neuroscience implicating religiousness. So it becomes increasingly difficult to find something about human life, even the deepest and richest parts of human life, for which we don't have physical 
properties or physical patterns in our brain sub substrates that are involved in those and 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 undergird them. So does is a soul necessary uh, if you can understand this in this way? Uh, and then you go back, of course, and biblic and the Christian history and biblical theology and see that that body soul dualism is not a clear implication, then you come forward to neuroscience and say, well, maybe we need to understand people differently, not as separate souls, non-material souls and bodies, but as ritually human, relational, uh, rational, moral, moral religious, religious bodies, persons in the world. So you're basically eliminating these four categories, rational, relational, moral, and religious as, as exclusive items that need to be explained by some immaterial substance. Yes. yes. And you can explain all by the, the neuroscience of the brain. Explain would be a pretty heavy word. We don't have you know, exhaustive explanations of all of those. But, but you have some, enough confidence yeah. in what yeah. you've learned so far yeah. that you expect progress where they can be explained. Yeah. In the moral field, we know that moral processing, processing dilemmas at least, is going along highly involved in our emotional systems as much so as, as sort of verbal propositional systems. Mm. That's some new information. The theories were there, but information is support one theory versus Good. another. So the last refuge of the soul, uh, I would think, would be the phenomenal, internal, subjective, first-person feeling that we have, because you can create the behavioral characteristics of all four mm -hmm. rational mm -hmm. uh, thinking relationship between entities and, and then expressions of morality and religion. You can create all of those. Um, in some in some uh, mechanistic way, but to account for the internal sense that we have would be the last refuge of the soul. Would you agree with that? Um, I'm not saying it's real, but I'd say it's the last refuge. Yeah, the last refuge. Yeah, <laughs> and and again, it comes back to uh, whether the consciousness and that subjective experience of life is um, totally mysterious. That is, if there aren't uh, prog isn't progress being made in neuroscience towards understanding consciousness, it's uh, in some sense a a um, non scientific non a question not answerable by science to account for a particular person's quality of subjective experience at a particular time, mm. but that's not a overlay we put on any domain of science that is to account for a particular person's hmm. uh, visual experience at the moment we look at what is generally true of religious of visual experience for example so i i don't think um not being able to account for precisely my subjective experience at this moment is a necessary reason to say that consciousness can't in some way be understood and in, understood in a brain slash body way, an embodied way. So I think our consciousness is embodied. I don't think that we will need a soul to explain uh, a, um, our embodied consciousness. And just from a theological perspective, I think a rich and complex human physical agent is sufficient for theology and religiousness.